Hi, this is John Hauser, and I will be talking to you about MRSA, VISA, and VERSA. MRSA, VISA, and VERSA is quite a mouthful, so what does it actually stand for? Well, it's actually pretty simple. They're all just strains of Staphylococcus aureus that are resistant either intermediately or totally to various antibiotics. For instance, MRSA stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Um, so it's resistant to methicillin, but it's also resistant to a whole host of other antibiotics, including uh, fluoroquinolones, erythromycin, oxycillin, and tetracycline. So in the past, the antibiotic that we've used to kill uh, MRSA has been vancomycin. But recently, uh, strains of Staphylococcus aureus that are resistant either intermediately or totally to vancomycin have cropped up. Vancomycin intermediate Staphylococcus aureus, or VISA, or vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, VERSA. These three different strains are shown in the three figures. Uh, MRSA is shown on the left, VISA is shown in the middle, and VERSA is shown on the right. As you can see, there's not a whole lot of morphological difference between the three because they're all just part of the same uh, species of bacteria. Since these are all strains of Staphylococcus aureus, I'll give you a brief refresher of S. aureus itself. Um, S. aureus is a gram-positive cocci that, um, since it's Staphylococcus, it's famous for you know, forming in those uh, clusters that look like a bunch of grapes. Um, S. aureus itself is non-spore forming, it's non-motile, it's a facultative anaerobe, and it's also a mesophile, which is important because mesophiles thrive in the temperatures that we keep our bodies at. Um, and Staphylococcus aureus is also very, very common. Uh, I think about one in three people in America are actually carriers of S. aureus. Clinically, the way that these three strains would typically be differentiated between would be that a doctor would be um, presented with a, what appears to be a normal staph infection, and he would prescribe one of the basic antibiotics for it, like amoxicillin or erythromycin or something along those lines. Um, and then if he gets no response from that antibiotic, he would probably get to suspect that he's dealing with MRSA, um, probably prescribe vancomycin for it. If he, again, gets no response from the vancomycin, then he'd probably assume that he's dealing with VERSA or VISA. Um, in the laboratory, however, the these three strains are differentiated by testing them with various concentrations of different antibiotics. So they'll put them in test tubes with different concentrations and see what the lowest concentration of specific antibiotics is that will keep them from growing. Um, and in doing that, they test for the MIC, or the minimum inhibitory concentration. So for MRSA, the MIC of oxicillin is got to be greater than or equal to 4 micrograms per milliliter. And for cefotoxin, which is just another antibiotic, it's got to be equal to or greater than 8 micrograms per milliliter. And then for VISA, uh, the MIC for vancomycin has to be between 4 and 8 mi uh, micrograms per milliliter. And for VERSA, the MIC of vancomycin has to be greater than or equal to 16 micrograms per milliliter. So what do these infections look like? Well, it's important to remember when talking about MRSA, VISA, and VERSA that they're all just different strains of Staphylococcus aureus. So they'll just present the same symptoms as staph infections, but they're just resistant to certain antibiotics. So what do staph infections look like? Um, the most common type of staph infection that you're going to see is called a soft skin and tissue infection, or an SSTI. And these are often purulent, which means that um, you can think of them as being like a big zit. Basically, they're uh, they're swollen, they're full of pus, uh, and they come to like a big a big white or yellow head, sort of. Um, these can typically be drained with like a needle or something like that. Uh, and that type of infection is often mistaken by by the patient for a spider bite um, before before a doctor corrects them and figures out what it actually is. Um, and when when this sort of infection is found not in a hospital setting but just in the community, uh, what will often happen is that the doctor will try to treat it without having to use any sort of antibiotics. So he'll he'll drain the uh, the infected area uh, 
and then of the, of the pus and stuff. And then he'll have the patient use, you know, proper hygiene when caring for the wound after that. And hopefully he won't have to use any antibiotics. Um, but if this SSTI presents as um, cellulitis where there's no there's no real pussy area. It's just the skin. It's it's red. It's swollen, but there's no pus collecting, so you can't really drain it. Um, or if so, if it's cellulitis in community, or if he's in a hospital setting, um, they might just go straight to using antibiotics to try to treat uh, the the infection. Um, so aside from SSTIs, another way that you can get infected by SRS is through food poisoning. Um, where you just, you eat can, food that's been contaminated by the bacteria. Um, and while, you know, this isn't fun by any means, uh, you might experience, uh, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, or any or all of the above. It's, it's definitely not life threatening. Um, so it's typically one of the, one of the things that people worry a lot less about when it comes to SRES. Um, third way that you can, be infected from SRS is if it infects a joint. So, uh, in septic arthritis is where the bacteria will just infect one specific joint. Um, you'd experience, you know, redness, swelling in the joint, extreme pain in the joint. Sometimes there's a fever as well. Um, but again, not a life threatening condition typically as long as it's treated. Um, but the, the two big conditions that SRS infections can bring on if they're not treated. Um, are sepsis and toxic shock syndrome. These are, these are very, uh, they can be deadly. So in sepsis, the bacteria that's in the tissues and in infection, it can move to the bloodstream. And then once it's in the bloodstream, it can travel throughout the body. It can infect, uh, the lungs. It can infect the, the heart. Or it can infect the brain, possibly. Um, and on top of all that, it can also bring on a condition called septic shock, uh, which is potentially deadly. Um, and then toxic shock syndrome is very, very similar in which the bacteria itself doesn't move into the bloodstream, but it secretes toxins into the bloodstream. Um, and these toxins can bring on um, toxic shock, which is another condition similar to septic shock where it can also be deadly. Uh, in this slide, you can see what uh, just two images of what one of those SSTIs would look like. Um, and the picture on the bottom right, uh, you've got an untreated one, um, where you can see that uh, sort of the, the redness, the swelling, um, the pussy sort of area that it all comes up to that yellow head. Um, and then from the middle of that yellow head, you can even you can see some pus coming out of it. And then that image in the top left is actually. Um, uh, one of these SSTIs in which a, a doctor has decided to lance it uh, and try to drain as much uh, as much fluid and pus uh, from the from the area as he can uh, in an effort to treat the infection. So who's at risk when it comes to these strains of Staph aureus? Um, the first big group is uh, patients inside hospitals, and that's because um, first of all, they're just um, the incidence of MRSA bacteria inside hospitals is just much greater than in the population in general. Um, and second, because there are a lot of patients inside the hospitals that are just much more susceptible to uh, infections by Staphylococcus aureus than uh, healthy individuals. For instance, surgery patients have uh, large incisions. Those serve as great points of entry for SRES. Um, immunocompromised patients are much more susceptible to any sort of infection. Um, and SRS would take advantage of that. Um, and then patients with invasive devices like catheters or dialysis ports, those devices would serve as really good points of entry, just like the incisions. Um, and then the second big group that you see a lot of cases in uh, is out in the community in sports teams. Um, and that can be either because of uh, poor hygiene in the locker room where equipment's getting shared and whatnot without being washed or um, because uh, contact sports can cause uh, like turf burn or lacerations, and those serve as really good points of entry for the disease. These strains are actually pretty prevalent. Um, since the discovery of MRSA back in the 1960s, 
um, the incidence of infections in the United States has increased dramatically um, from 2% of all staph infections in the U.S. back in 1974 were MRSA related. Now 60% uh, in 2004 were MRSA related. Um, and in 2005, more deaths in the United States were caused by MRSA than were actually caused by AIDS. Um, but there is a sort of brighter side. Um, the number of life-threatening cases um, that are healthcare related, so like the uh, the surgery patients, the immunocompromised patients that we talked about, um, MRSA cases in those patients are actually on the decline. So that, that number fell 54% between 2005 and 2011. And there are actually 9,000 fewer deaths in the United States due to those sort of cases. So there you have it. That is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, vancomycin-intermediate Staphylococcus aureus, and vancomycin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Thanks for watching, and see you all Monday.